turn with me and your Bible to James chapter two again? And we're going to consider what does James say about living faith? Now, do you remember there were three components when we talk about faith? What makes up a living faith? The first one is knowledge. You've got to know something, right? So what do we need to know? We need to know about our God. We need to know that God is the creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. We need to know that he's good. He's perfect. He's holy. We need to know that he created people to be made in his image. When he made the man and woman, they were made in his image. We are supposed to be good, perfect, and holy, like God is good. But instead of that, we also need to know that we have turned away from God. We're following after our own desires instead of the way he would like things to be. But we also know that God sent his son into the world so that he could bring us back to himself. When Jesus came into the world, he he became a man so that he could live a perfect life like I ought to have lived. He suffered and died for punishment that I should have taken. And then he was buried. And then he rose up again. And now he's a living savior. We need to know these things. This is the first part of faith, knowledge. The second thing is to believe that they're true. It's one thing to hear something, know something. It's another thing to believe it. But there's a third critical part. And do you remember what that is? It's the idea of trust. And um, it's one thing to know something, but it's another thing to put your trust into it, to to depend in it. And uh, that's, we had the example of a parachute. Remember a parachute? It's one thing to look at a parachute and say, wow, this looks like a good, pretty good parachute. But it's another thing to put that parachute on and leap out of the plane and put your trust into it. And so when we talk about believing in Jesus, we're talking about a living faith. We're talking about a faith that doesn't just believe the truth, but that depends on it. Their life is changed because of their trust in it. And that's the question that James is asking, he's posing to us in this trial of living faith. Is that the faith that we're enjoying? Do we have this living faith or is it dead? Does it produce or is it fruitless? And so let's consider this test. And so I'm going to read in James chapter two, starting in verse 20. He says this, you foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. So James introduces us to the first of two examples to demonstrate what this living faith looks like. And the first one is Abraham. And if you want to turn with me to um, Genesis 22, way at the beginning of the Bible, um, we're going to hear the account of Abraham, how he offered his son Isaac. And let me set the background. When Abraham was 75 years old, um, God called him. This is, the knowledge of God was almost lost in the world. And God called him out of this other land. He said, follow me to the place that I'll show you. And so at age 75, he packed up his wife and his family, and they moved to the place where God said, Maybe 10 or 12 years later, Abraham's in his mid-80s now, and he's been following God for a while, and God repeats the promise to him. And one of the blessings that God promised to Abraham was that that he would be made into a great nation. He would have children, and they would have children, and they would turn into this great nation. But now at age 85, and his wife Sarah, similarly, is um, has not had, she's 75, and they have not had kids yet. God repeated his promise. And Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, um, what can you give me? Because I remain childless. And God repeated the promise again. He took Abraham outside and said, Abraham, look, look at the stars in the sky. Count them if you can. Just like those stars in the sky, that's how many your children will be. And it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He trusted God. Even though Abraham couldn't see God's promise yet, he trusted him and his life oriented towards God's word. And finally, when Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was 90, 25 years after he was first called by God, the day finally came when God gave them their child, their son, Isaac, the the fulfillment of God's promise. So now Genesis chapter 22 is where we are. This is maybe another 15, 20 years later. Um, And sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll tell you about. 
So can you imagine? I mean, it sounds almost absurd. This, this promise that God had made to Abraham that had finally come true after 25 years, and now 30, 40 years later, God is asking Abraham to take this promised son before he was married, before he had any children, and sacrifice him and to kill him at the place that God said. But this is where Abraham demonstrates his true and living faith. He had, he had walked with God so long now that he knew that God was trustworthy. He's seen God's promise against all odds in giving him this son to start with. And so he makes the journey. He takes everything needed for the sacrifice. He takes the wood. He takes the uh, fire. He takes the knife. And he follows God to where God directs him to go. He lays Isaac down on the altar. And can you imagine what's going through his head? How could God do this? How could God ask me to remove this only way through the promise? Um, but God, but Abraham, had, his faith was deep enough that he did trust God. And the book of Hebrews actually says that Abraham figured that well, God could even raise Isaac back from the dead. So Abraham rose the knife. He was about to plunge it into his son's chest. And then God called out to him through an angel and said, stop. I know. Um, don't do anything to the boy. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And God provided a ram for Abraham to sacrifice in the place of his son. So after all of this time, um, Abraham's faith has been deepening and maturing. And it's one thing where um, Abraham was counted righteous in God's sight because he trusted in God. But how do I know that? How did Abraham know that himself? It's when he demonstrated this amazing act of faith and trust in God. So going back to James chapter 2 and picking up in verse 22, he says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. It's easy to say, I believe in God, but it's when we actually see what happens that we can see that our faith is true and genuine. So this is called the test of true faith. Now, there's a second example that James gives, and it follows right after the first one. He says in verse 25, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? Um, now, it says in the same way, Rahab and Abraham are two people as different as night and day. Um, which is probably why James uses these examples, because the same thing applies to everybody who believes in God. Abraham was a well-respected patriarch of the family. He was a shepherd, successful trader. Rahab was a wicked prostitute. Abraham was the father of the Jews. Rahab, a woman Gentile, um, outside the promises of God. Abraham had spent many years in the presence of God, his faith deepening and maturing, hear hearing the, the words of God. Rahab um, had just heard about secondhand what God has been doing in Egypt with the Israelites. But they both had a true faith in the one true God. And as James points out, their actions demonstrated. And Rahab's story is in Joshua too. And the story is this, is she was a prostitute living in Jericho at the time when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness, and now they're going to take possession of the promised land. And so Jericho was like the first big city standing in the way of the Israelites taking that land that God was giving them. And so they sent spies into the city to see what was going on. And, um, and um, she didn't know much about God, but she did know that he, what he had done to the Egyptians. And she did know um, that, th that he was going to win in the end. Um, so when the spies came into the city, Rahab realized who they were. She helped them. She switched teams. She went from team Jericho to team Israel because she knew that following the true God was the path to life. She didn't know much. Uh, but she knew that. She risked her life to save those spies. She knew that she was giving up her old way of life to go join another nation. And that's what marks true faith. It's such a trust in God that you turn away from the things that are precious to you and you turn toward God, who is the way to life. And so James concludes with verse 26. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. If Abraham said, you know what, God, I love you. I trust you. I have faith in you, but I can't kill my son. He's too precious to me. What will we say about his faith? Is it a living faith? What if Rahab had said, um, you know what, God, I stand in awe of what you've done. I know what you did to the Egyptians. I know you brought the Israelites 
um, through the wilderness. And I know that you promised them the, the promised them this land that we're in, but I can't leave my people. I can't leave what I've got here. It's too precious to me. What kind of faith would that be? So true faith, a faith that's alive, a faith that saves, is one in which you treasure God above other things. You trust God's word instead of trusting even your own wisdom and your own thoughts. And in that treasuring, in that trusting, it changes the way that we live. It makes a difference. None of us is perfect. Um, we are, I still sin every day in my thoughts, my words, in my deeds. But, but if we possess this living faith, we don't wallow in that sin. We don't just sit there and don't care about it. We don't ignore it. No, what we do is we hate it. We, we confess our sins to God. We turn away from our sins and, 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 and try to follow after him like we ought to, right? That's what it means to, to, to have this living faith. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When Jesus says he gave himself for us, it's not only to take away our punishment, but it's to give us this life, the life that I now live in my body, the life that I live now. I live by faith, which means that I trust what God says. My whole life orients that way. So you can, can you understand this trial of, um, a trial of living faith? What James wants us each to ask ourselves is my faith, is it alive or is it dead? Is it orienting my life in a certain direction? Can you see my trust in the Lord? Or do I look just like everybody else who doesn't know the Lord? Do we have a living faith that's vital? Do we have a dead faith that is useless? And that's the question that he asks us. So I know these are kind of heavy things, maybe difficult to understand, but, but pray to God for understanding. Read through James chapter two again. And, and I pray that, that God will, will teach you these things. Look forward to seeing you tonight.